You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, rats, bats, and mice of all ages, we welcome you to the wonderful world of Walt Disney's Animation Studios or, you know, Systematic Ecology, talking about Walt Disney's Animation Studios. This is part of our series going through the various eras of Disney's animated films to review. Um, this is the second film we've done in the Bronze Era. Some people call it the drop, the Dark Ages of Disney Animation. Um, again, this is Systematic Ecology. We are the Priest of the Geeks. I am Joshua Knoll. Um, lately, what I've been geeking out on, man, they dropped three new episodes of um, <laughs> Our Flag Means Death. It's still great. It's just a good show. Lots of entertainment for me. Yeah. TJ, what you been geeking out on? I'm here with the one and only, the greatest co-host of all time, TJ Tiberius Juan Blackwell. TJ, what you been geeking out on? Um, Valorant still. Just diving really, really hard into Valorant. Yeah. Doing some hyper-focus. Just really just, yeah. Yeah, Checks it's out. what I was doing before this. It's what I will be doing when we're done recording. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing with work. I've been hyper-focusing on Chipotle, but... Starting to stabilize. I'll save that for our God moment on our other podcast. Speaking of which, if you guys want to check out the AMP Network, AMP, Amazon Ministries Podcast Network. You can see other shows like this, like uh, me and TJ's other show, The Whole Church Podcast. I'll be sharing a God moment about what I just said. And right now we're doing an ecumenical aesthetic series. If you want to hear about arts from different churches, check that out. But today we're going to be going forward. Um, we're going to be doing more of our Disney eras. And Upon request, we're going to be doing more than what we originally planned for this series because people love this series. So we're going to do going forward for the Renaissance, post-Renaissance, etc. We'll be doing three films for each era instead of two. Then once we've finished up with the revival era, we'll go back around to the gold, war, silver, and bronze era films and do one more for each of them. So each era will have three film reviews each when it's all said and done. But for now, this will be the last of our bronze era films. We'll be The Great Mouse Detective. Speaking of which, episode proper, The Great Mouse Detective is one of three pivotal movies in Disney's history. Um, in my mind, the three biggest movies in the history of Disney. If you're going to follow it and make sense of where Disney is today, you got to make sense of how these three movies were made. The Black Cauldron, Fox and the Hound, and The Great Mouse Detective. Because these were the last films that Disney's nine old men were a part of. So this is where the transition gets really interesting. We'll talk some about later. But, you know, you had Walt Disney, his last movie being The Jungle Book, the end of the Silver Era. Then you get the Bronze Era, the Dark Ages. They're trying to figure out who is Disney, what is their identity without Walt there anymore. But you have this nine men that he worked with still here, so who knew Disney, kind of like the disciples, right? After this, no more. This is the church after the apostles. This is there's no one left from the original era. Who is Disney after this? And that's when we kick off the Renaissance era, which some people say is the best part of Disney. I'm not one yeah. of them, but I, yeah. I can see the argument. Yeah. I think we, I think Frozen, it would be like the fourth, you know, just while we're talking about it. I think Frozen's the fourth pivotal moment. It's the company's just noticeably. Yeah. 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 But that's a, yeah, that's like after the Renaissance, they're trying to redefine themselves again. They have like a second dark ages during the post Renaissance. And then Frozen happens, which and in our host, ironically, there's a lot of debate on whether or not Frozen is good. Uh, TJ and I disagree about this. I, mean, I disagree with a lot of our hosts, it turns out. I, I think Frozen pretty stellar, but I like it because of its criticisms on the Renaissance era of Disney. But all of that are for future Disney episodes. <laughs> so hang in there. Disney will tell you why Frozen's bad later, other than just Frozen bad. I think that's usually how it goes, right? Yeah. Frozen bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I disagree. But... Um, so the other movie we reviewed in the Bronze Era, we talked about last time, Disney's Robin Hood. I love Robin Hood. It's a great movie. A lot of times these movies, Fox and the Hound, Robin Hood, these who aren't usually people's favorite Disney, but some people might be aware of them. Some people call them the Disney adequates. So if you hear that term thrown around, it's usually talking about these kind of movies. Um, and in fact... I got this movie confused with The Rescuers. I, it turns out that I was just wrong about what this movie was. I didn't really know what it was until like a year ago, maybe. Thanks to TJ playing a character, Radigan, and Disney's Villainous. Yeah. That's really funny. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to kick it off to TJ, since apparently you knew about this movie before me. <laughs> um, what is your relationship? How did you first come across The Great Mouse Detective? And um, what are your memories with this film and the characters? Uh, we had Great Mouse Detective 
on VHS at my daycare and we watched it, you know, not all the time, we watched it pretty frequently because like we also had the Jungle Book and the Rescuers and, you know, just a ton of yeah. other movies. So you know, I watched it when I was young, kind of often, but yeah. just not recently. And it kind of faded from my mind because no one ever talks about it and it's never in there. You know, playing Villainous was the first time that I thought about it in a long time. I was like, was that like a big nostalgia moment for you then? You saw that and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, this guy. No, my memories aren't strong enough to cause nostalgia. <laughs> All right. It's just like, oh, cool. Radigan. Yeah. Well, it was so funny, too, because I apparently forgot. I, I got it confused with the rescuers. So we're playing this card game and you start throwing these like character based things down. And I'm like, I don't remember any of this. What does this have to do with? the?" <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is actually a different movie. Um, and. and Upon thinking about like doing some research for this movie and just kind of trying to pick my own brain, I think at one point I tried to find this because I was on a big, I wanted to see every single Disney movie kick, right? And the um, the issue came up where I couldn't get it because of the, you know, Disney Vault thing. You couldn't get movies. Then Disney Plus came around. We played Villainous. Um, and post that, I was like, well, I got to watch this movie. And I guess really my history is going to boil more down to the Sherlock Holmes aspect where I have read a lot of Sherlock Holmes, seen a lot of different versions of the movies and shows of Sherlock Holmes. And I'm watching this thinking, wait a minute, this is basically Sherlock Holmes. And then they mention Sherlock Holmes. So he is a human real person in this uh, world created by the movie. And um, yeah, I was like, actually, Basil might be. And I actually texted you after I watched it. I remember I texted TJ and said, can Basil be my favorite movie adapted Sherlock Holmes and his answer was absolutely yes he absolutely yeah. can he's straight yeah. up based on a book that is based on Sherlock Holmes yeah see that was the other thing that was interesting so it's the this movie the great mouse detective isn't technically based on Sherlock Holmes it's based on Basil of Baker Street which is what this movie was originally going to be titled more on that later um, and that book was based on Sherlock Holmes. So the books were kind of like kid versions of Sherlock Holmes to get people introduced to this detective and all of this stuff. So uh, let's let's go there for a minute. TJ, what is your history with Sherlock Holmes? Not great. I like I've, <laughs> I've just never been <laughs> That's uh, a huge like Sherlock Holmes fan. Uh, my mom owned a couple of, you know, Conan Doyle books. Sorry, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh <laughs> I never read them because I didn't want to read my mom's books. And, uh, you know, just over time, I kind of started like reading a Sherlock story here or there, knowing yeah. of him. Uh, I really do not like Sherlock, the show. Oh, bad opinion. Yeah. No, it's not. And, no, that's uh, how it is. <laughs> mm. That's that's pretty much how it goes. Most of the adaptations of uh, Sherlock, I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay, sure. It's fine. Funny. Funny. This is my favorite. Yeah, that's fair. Our mutual friend, who we will call Q today, uh, one of his, it might be his favorite books of all time, is either these or the Tarzan books. So it, it always feels weird when we're talking about the Disney versions, because I'm like, I know they're not the version. I do know that. And I know he's listening. And he's going, wait, why has TJ not read more Sherlock? And why are we only talking <laughs> about this Disney movie? I'm like, well, you know, it's a Disney series. But... um. <laughs> Which we'll talk more about Sherlock because I do love Sherlock personally. Growing up with a lot of the books, reading it, the Sherlock series got me back on that kick because it's just one of the best TV shows maybe ever produced. It's fantastic stuff, in, in my opinion. Obviously, not everyone's opinion. Um, that's where Benedict Cumberbatch kind of gets his start. Uh, or not his start, but that's where he kind of gets known for. And yeah, he was great. I thought that was a really good modern edition. But then Americans tried to do it again with like elementary. And that was that was bad. That I, I personally don't like that. I know a lot of people who do love it and a lot of people who like Sherlock Holmes more than me that love it. So I feel weird criticizing it, but it just wasn't I just didn't love it. Um, and then, the, you know, there's a Robert Downey Jr. and Sherlock Holmes movie. There's all kind of different Sherlock Holmes movies. But yeah, I got to say, even Benedict Cumberpatch pales in comparison to the great Basil of Baker Street. <laughs> just something about it i was like this guy this is it you know it shows up and you get the scene of him um he's doing some detective work he tells people immediately when they walk in of their whole life story he starts playing the violin he's depressed because he thought he found something out and he wasn't right and it's like yeah this is a this is what sherlock's supposed to be perfect we don't need to add a bunch of drugs and some you know any other thing i'll just let sherlock be sherlock yeah yeah uh yeah as a 
critical Sherlock character analyst. Definitely. I agree. <laughs> All right. So you're not a big Sherlock fan, but you did watch this movie a lot. And we're here to talk about um, th this movie by many names. We're just going to call it The Great Mouse Detective. It has been known as The Adventures of the Great Mouse Detective. If you go on Spotify, it's under that. Um, it was changed for a brief period to that. And then people were like, yeah, nope, just Great Mouse yep. Detective. We're going to go back really to that name. That is what happened. Yeah. 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 And then originally it was going to be Baker at Basil, Basil Street. <laughs> I'm going to I keep teasing people this. I'm going to wait till later for now. TJ, could you describe just kind of give a summary? What is the story of this film? What's this about? Uh, how loosely, well, you know, up to your discretion, your show, your world. So basically we have rat Sherlock, mouse Sherlock. Sorry, I didn't mean to be insensitive and uh, funny. He <laughs> finds this case where a rat has kidnapped somebody and uh, he slowly uncovers his plot to take over all of Maustum. <laughs> yeah. It's really hard to talk about this movie and it not just sound ridiculous. It is very much a ridiculous film. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think, like, basically you have Basil, who is a mouse living in Sherlock Holmes' house or apartment, I guess, on Baker Street, for those of us. There are so many nods to the original books that, like, if you're a huge Sherlock Holmes geek, this film is just littered with random little nods, little, like, cameos and just like kind of puns within and you're like okay this is fun so i had a lot of fun with that um but outside of that really it's just a good fun kids movie i feel like you know this kid um well i say that and then immediately say this kid's father was kidnapped uh, then, <laughs> but she ends up with the help of um basil and who is it it's not watson in this is it it's dawson is that right dawson, yeah yeah it almost sounds like watson because at one point he goes it's it's elementary my dear dawson and I just I laugh so hard when he says it because I'm like, it's the classic line. Um, but, you know, he's going through. They end up helping this kid find her dad. Her dad was kidnapped by Radigan, which Radigan, just one of the best, might be the most underrated Disney character. I'm not sure if I'm willing to be so bold to say for sure, but there's a strong chance he's the most underrated Disney character. I think it's Cusco. Yeah. Is Cusco really underrated, though? People like Cusco. People don't know who Radigan is. Yeah, but we're not going to talk about it. Because that's not what this episode's about. But I could talk about okay. it. <laughs> All right. Well, y'all hang in there. We, we'll probably talk about Emperor's New Groove eventually. Maybe in the post-Renaissance. Maybe outside of the series some other time. But for now then, TJ, as a 0 to 10, how would you rate the um, <laughs> the Great Mouse Detective? Uh, it's probably like an 8. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe right. like a seven and a half. I don't know. It's a good movie. Yeah. I was thinking 7. But that's because I'm rating it as a Disney movie. So I'm comparing it to other Disney movies, not just other cartoons. If I was doing other cartoons, probably like eight and a half. If I'm just comparing it to all of Disney, that's a little bit of a higher standard for me. You know? Yeah. It's it's one of my favorite Don Bluth movies. It's not a Don Bluth movie. <laughs> yeah, that's a fun joke that we're going to talk about soon. But <laughs> so so you said basically seven and a half or an eight. Where uh, Why would you get give it that? Can you unpack uh, that? So, like, it's good. It, it is really good. It feels grand and for children, which I feel like is what most kids' movies lack, is that it doesn't feel like a big adventure, really. Uh, this does. Yeah. Uh, but it's not... There's just something it lacks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you that. It, it seems almost too basic for Disney. Like, this is just such a stereotypical Disney movie. And I think the other thing for me is there are songs I enjoy in this. I will pick a favorite song out of this soon, but it doesn't compare to some of the other Disney soundtracks. So like, it just feels like that's what's missing for me. It's like, it doesn't have a bare necessities. It doesn't have a Hakuna Matata. You know, it's just, it's got some good songs. I'm, I'm glad we got to hear. Um, who was it? Who was it? Is it? Um, why can't I think of Radigan's name right now? Mm, it's a price. Yeah. Yeah. I love that we get to hear him sing. Like, that was just fun. <laughs> Vincent Price really, he made the movie. So I'm glad you remembered his yeah. name. Yeah, um, stellar performance, actually. Yeah. And then the other thing really is, it's good animation, but nothing astounding. Like, there's nothing in this movie that I'm like, like, um, when we talked about, uh, what was it? The um, Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. And that scene of the horseman coming down the road. That animation is something that you have to talk about. Like, it's one of those where, like, no, this is something people need to study. This movie, I'm like, animation was good. There's nothing to me that I was like, oh, wow, that was that was impressive, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Which is not to discount how hard animation is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I actually think it's important. So when we talk about like the art and animation of this film, I think it's important that it wasn't all that crazy because remember, this is the last one with one of Disney's nine old men that were part of the movie. Um, Why can't I think of the guy's name right now? Anyway, guy's name was it was it Eric Watson. One of the Disney's nine old men was still um, was the animated the animation advisor for the film. Didn't do a lot of the animating himself. But I, I think what was important was since this was like them handing it over to the new fold, basically, I think it was important that we go back to the basics. We animate just a normal Disney movie. Uh, then we could do the wild stuff later. Like, I feel like you have to go back to the basics first. So I'm kind of glad they did that, um, especially with a large part of why I think this movie didn't make as big of an impact as it could have. It came out one year after the Black Cauldron. They spent four years advertising Black Cauldron, and then the very next year, boom. Oh, yeah, here's another one, by the way. Yeah. Usually, there's it like four years in between Disney movies. Yeah, it did. I think if they would have just spent four years advertising this instead, it probably would have been huge. <laughs> yeah. It was I, a I good just, movie. If, I think they should have just uh, changed the culture to make them want to see the Black Cauldron like they did for Nemo. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I feel like the opposite happened here of what happened with Treasure Planet and Lilo and Stitch. Where, like, with that situation, they advertise Lilo and Stitch a lot, and that's why people love that movie, and not a ton of people know Treasure Planet the way that TJ does. That's true. This was the opposite. They tried to do that, where they marketed the crap out of the Black Cauldron, and then released this the next year, and people were like, yeah, we don't care about the Black Cauldron. We care about this mouse movie. <laughs> Which really comes back to bite them, because um, that's where Disney actually, one of the few times Disney was outdone by other animators, were the Don Bluth movies because he tried to help with the uh, Black Cauldron. Didn't like how Disney handled that. So he left and started doing his own movies. That's where you get like Fantasia. Um, what's the, the the Western Mouse movies you know what I'm talking about? The Western Mouse movies. What are the names of those? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't <laughs> Why don't you know the name of this? The, uh, I loved these as a kid. The only like Don Bluth movies I actually know are Titan A.E. And I think he helped with the Simpsons movie. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't the American Tales, weren't they Don Bluth movies? Like I said, the only <laughs> Don Bluth movies I know <laughs> are uh, Ty Mayi and I think he worked on the Simpsons movie. Oh, man. That's funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the an American Tale, that was Don Bluth. It, did, it outdid Great Mouse Detective, and then they made a bunch of sequels to it. So he left Disney, went and did his own thing, and actually did better than Disney for a while with the movies that you mentioned, American Tale, Fantasia. Did you, you've seen Fantasia, right? Oh, yeah. Pretty recently, actually, yeah. you know, God, compared it was pretty, to it was a, that was a, good a lot of things. Yeah. So he actually outdid. So maybe he did a good move leaving Disney. Maybe. I don't know, man. Oh, uh, he also made All Dogs Go to Heaven, which is fantastic. Fantastic movie. Yeah. And Land Before um, Time, which is yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And why it's funny to, to throw this in here, because like a lot of his movies are mouse based for some reason. And this animation does look a lot like a Don Bluth movie. <laughs> like. I think most people, if you told them it was, they'd believe you, assuming they know who Don Bluth is. Yeah, yeah. which most people don't. Which might not be. That's, that might not be most people. But um, I so think one of the so real quick though, I pulled up his sheet to look. Uh, I think it's really funny uh, to mention all the other movies that he has worked on that you would just have no no clue about. Uh, Sabrina the I Teenage Witch. What? Uh, the Archie Show. I was trying to say Anastasia, by the way, not Fantasia. Yeah, I knew what you meant. Okay. Uh, well, Escape we'll to Witch it. Mountain from 1975 and hmm. Xanadu. Uh, a few video games. The Dragon Slayer series. I've never what? played, but I've heard about. That's so uh, weird. Yeah. I noticed, I know a couple of these. Um, Rock a Doodle. I actually saw that. I don't remember under what context, but Titan AE. You mentioned I that do, on an I episode that's coming up soon. Yeah. 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 I really do. Anyway, um, more art and animation stuff. Radigan himself was originally going to be kind of like a scrawny, Weasley kind of character that was just going to be kind of like lurking in the shadows. And then um, Vincent Price, I think you said it was who <laughs> played him. Yeah, uh, he actually had to try out and he even said any production company other than Disney would ask me to do a tryout. I just wouldn't do their movie. He's like, since it was Disney, he wanted to do it. So he does it. And the uh, the animators actually said that his voice loomed too large. 
So they had to recreate Radigan to be a larger than life creature, which is funny because he's a rat. But I do feel like as a villain, he does have that larger than life kind of feeling. And yet he's still kind of a mustache twirling bad guy. Yeah, I think it's a good I think a good villain design has to yeah. fit the tone of the story. And the tone did just didn't feel like scrawny, scraggly villain to me. Yeah, no. You know? Which, yeah. Which makes me wonder if, like, they designed him before or after they did the music. Um, Henry Mancetti actually Probably was the composer. After. Yeah. Also, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But Mancetti's a genius. Um yeah, I love Radikin's design. He, as far as the art goes, he probably was the best part of the movie to me. Um, and of course, I, you guys know, I always love mentioning any gag animation because it's just my favorite thing that animators occasionally do that they don't do as much these days. So I'm going to keep being an old man and complain about it. But whenever um, <laughs> the dog's ear turns into a staircase for the mouths to go up, I loved that. It was just so funny. It was just such a small thing. I was like, yeah, entertainment at its finest. <laughs> yeah. I uh, before we move on from you know talking about Vincent Price, do you know his final movie that he was in was Edward Scissorhands? What? No, yeah, he's he's the inventor. He's the God. old guy. That's funny because Radigan is kind of an inventor, sort of. No, no, he kidnaps an inventor though. Yeah, it counts. Listen, he got the job done. <laughs> he invents traps, I guess. <laughs> I uh, we're gonna talk more about Radigan because I just. I actually I want to say this here because I just can't wait any longer. I think the whole reason I love this movie can really boil down to Radigan gets a record and records himself singing goodbye so, so that his enemy's last thing he'd hear was himself singing so long farewell. And that like the amount of like commitment to the bit and just arrogance that that takes and everything. I'm like, that's just that's a good bad guy right there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, so the thing I've been holding off with the with the name change, where it was Basil of, of Baker Street, and then they changed it to Great Mouse Detective, supposedly because the young Sherlock movie didn't do very well. I don't understand how this makes it sound less like Sherlock. Maybe because everybody knew Baker Street. I don't know. But after they changed it, someone in the production company got so upset about it, they sent out a mass memo to the company. <laughs> Where it was just them renaming all of other Disney's others movies really poorly. So like Jungle Book was a boy, a black bear, and a tiger. <laughs> and then like uh Snow White, the Seven Dwarves were a princess and some short people. <laughs> like they just like no. renamed everything. What it was, was it? There's some short men. Seven seven little men help a girl. <laughs> Do you have the list pulled up by chance? I pulled it up earlier. Oh God! I I wish I, we had it. Some I mean, of these I have, are so I can funny. Scroll down. I have the wiki. Yeah, up. yeah. Find find some of these. They're just they're too yeah. funny to me. <laughs> like, so, like, can you imagine being so upset uh, about a name change? Two dogs fall in love. Uh, puppies <laughs> taken away. I'm not going to say the names, the correct names for these. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know, you don't the know. <laughs> the little deer who grew up. Uh, <laughs> the girl with the see-through shoes. The wonderful elephant oh, who God. could really fly. <laughs> I think that's actually all of them. Yeah. God, it was just so funny. Can you imagine just working for the company and someone just gets that petty and you just get this email? I think I would might have actually fell out laughing. Yeah. Just get an email of just some bad Disney movie names. Yeah. Ed like, Gomber. Right. Oh, Ed God, Gomber funny stuff. is the one who did it. <laughs> um, hats off to you. You uh, achieved a level of pettiness that I can only um, aspire to, I believe. I just haven't quite reached it yet. One day. <laughs> um, yeah, so we mentioned Henry Mancetti. Fantastic composer. This was actually his first animated film that he did a score for. And it's funny because he's most known for the Pink Panther movies. Yeah, that famous bit. That's all him. They almost pulled Michael Jackson in to do a song number. Probably would have made the movie a lot more popular if I had to guess. You know? Yeah, maybe a little. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, then the producer, I love that this producer, you guys going to want to hold on to when we get to the Renaissance films, Bernie Madison. Before this, the only thing he was sole producer on, he did um, Mickey's Magical Christmas, one of my favorite movies growing up to watch around Christmas time. Um, it was a featurette, so that wasn't a full length movie. This was his first movie that he produced was Great Mouse Detective. And he's going to go on to do some of those big Renaissance films. And we're talking like Tarzan, Aladdin, that kind of stuff. You're going to be looking at this name, Bernie Madison. So this movie really helped him get his start. And if for no other reason, Great Mouse Detective is great because of that, because we all love all these other movies he did. And um, 
we might not have it without the great mouse detective. Yeah, true. So with that, TJ, uh, one thing I wanted to to kind of just kind of pick your brain about. I think we can all say, looking back now, they handed the company off pretty well. This was the last of the great Disney's nine old men, and then afterwards, the Renaissance movies. I think we can at least say we're good. Um, what is like? How do you do this well? Like, what do you think the importance was of this moment of? the nine old men letting go and the new people being able to take the company over. So like handing the flag off is, you know, it's important to do it well to, and to do it gracefully and to be willing to, you know, lose some of the credit for that. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it boils down to a lot of the time is people's pride getting in their way. Uh, yeah. Cause a lot of people are tempted to just like, Oh, whatever. I'm just going to tank this. They're taking over soon anyway. It's not going to be my problem. Yeah. But and yeah, I'm actually I'm torn on how I feel about something because I I'm probably not to sound like an arrogant jerk, but I feel like I'm more like Walt in the aspect I'm about to say where Walt worked until he died. He was always part of the project. He was actively part of Jungle Book, even though he passed before it came out. He was actively working on Pirates of the Caribbean like these were the things that he was doing when he passed away. Like in his deathbed, he was designing what Epcot would look like. I feel like I relate more to that, but I wonder if it was actually handled better that the nine old men passed this on before they died, you know? Yeah. Well, I, it just depends on the person, I think, because we've definitely seen some scenarios where like, you know, they're getting kind of old. It would be better for them to pass that, go ahead and pass that torch. So that mm -hmm. they don't die in their station and then whoever comes next just gets to replace them. Yeah. Yeah. Like and you were a Supreme court justice or something. <laughs> Who knows what you could be talking about. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's funny though, that actually what I thought of while you were talking, that made me feel bad for even suggesting this. Jesus died while he was doing his work. It's it still, it was handled pretty well how it was passed on. I feel like, you know? Oh yeah, that's fair. Most yeah. of us are not him. Yeah, most of us don't know we're about to die, so we don't prepare as well, maybe. But but maybe that's the key of like once you started something and this is this is where we get a little bit meta because, you know, I started systematic ecology and at some point I'm not going to be doing this anymore. So I'm even wondering, like, how how would I go about this? Do I prepare as if I'm going to die tomorrow so that, you know, everybody knows it's handled smoothly. Christian takes over or do I pull a Walt and in my deathbed? I'm like making the schedule for the next year. Like, guys, 2025's annual theme is going to be guys with hats. Please. You know, like <laughs> the guys I'm with hats in the 2025 Apex theme. <laughs> All right. You guys first heard it here. We're announcing the annual theme for 2025 systematic ecology guys with hats. Guys yeah. and gals with hats. Yeah, and gals. And we'll all be wearing hats during the recording, I assume. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think maybe it's less about whether you do it until you die and more how you prepare people to take over. And you do that discipleship process, perhaps. Which is, actually, yeah, you could see that in, um, I want to say this was Eric Larson's last. Let me look this up to double check. But... I like that the last movie with one of Disney's nine old men wasn't one of them produced it and then suddenly they're gone. This was um yeah, okay, I have it here. I'm gonna go through this. Let's start with Fox and the Hound. You have one person supervising, one person co-producing, and an animation consultant, right? And then when you get to the Black Cauldron, you have some character design designers and an animation consultant. And then the Great Mouse Detective, all that's left is um Eric Larson, he is just an animation advisor. So I, I, I think that was actually key that it wasn't they produced and then the next movie, boom, someone else is producing. It's like they produced and then they kind of started stepping down slowly of, OK, we're going to be co-producer. I'm going to be an advisor now. And they didn't just suddenly go, boom, now someone else has the keys to the kingdom, pun intended. Yeah. 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 So anyway. More on the actual story side of things. Let's go back. What are your favorite? What's your? Let's do this one at a time. What's your favorite scene from this movie? If you had to pick one. Hmm. Hmm. I can do mine while you're thinking. Yeah, do yours. Uh, I think when Radigan's like first shown and they're doing that song, 
Song's not my favorite number. I like that scene because in the middle of singing, he stops, has the cat come out, eat one of the drunk mice who called him a rat because that's so offensive, even though he's very clearly a rat. It's in the name. But he wants to believe he's a mouse and that he's kind of more highbrow than what he was born. So he has this cat come and just eat the guy. And then he turns back around and goes, keep singing. And they finish the song number. <laughs> and to me, that was just the way they handled that was just so funny. I was like, that's good. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, I think like the final confrontation in Big Ben. Mm, yeah, that's a good one. The song it's, number for it's that also too. Gorgeous. Yeah, I don't know. I actually I, I like the uh, I like the greatest uh, villain in the world, greatest criminal in the world, whatever it's called. The first song, more Radigan's song, oh, okay. the world's greatest criminal mind. That's what it's called. My uh, my favorite song from this was "So Long Farewell." <laughs> We're singing goodbye <laughs> on the record. I, I think the scene does make the song funnier. But even on its own, I just the voice is just done so well. I'm like, I love it. Um, again, none of these songs are really like my favorite Disney song. All right. So we did favorite scene, favorite song. Who is your favorite character in this film? Mm, Radigan. Yeah, me too. It's funny because Basil's like my favorite Sherlock on TV. And yet Radigan was just so it's like such a good bad guy. Like it was just handled so well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so that's favorite song, favorite character and favorite scene. Moving on a little bit to some of the deeper conversation stuff for a little bit. Sherlock and Basil both are kind of anti-heroes. So we see Basil being kind of Sherlock's mouse counterpart. Um, but they both have this like not like your typical anti-hero where they're like killing people and doing whatever it takes to solve a thing. It's like they're not good because they have they like want to help people or anything. They're just arrogant jerks who want to prove that they're smarter than everyone else, which to me still makes them kind of an anti-hero. They're not really a hero. They're not doing that to save people. They're doing it because they want to prove they're smarter than everyone else, and the bad guy happens to be smart. I firmly believe that if Radigan or um, Moriarty, if we're talking about Sherlock, I think if either of them were good guys, I think Sherlock or Basil would have just been bad just to prove they were smarter than them. Like, I feel like it really isn't because of the condition of their heart or anything that they're good. They just want to prove they're smarter. Yeah. yeah. TJ's shaking his head. He agrees. I think that's one of the so, uh, like main like themes of, of a lot of Sherlock stories is that he's not that different. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But that makes me wonder because I have a couple of different thoughts. Is I'm going to start with how important do you think motives are? Is it important that Sherlock or Basil have good motives or do we not care about their motives? I don't care about their motives. Yeah, I feel like for me personally, I think my motives are important because I do care about how I treat others, where my heart is. As a Christian, you know, I feel like I want to do well according to God and my fellow man, all that kind of stuff. I don't know, like, as far as someone else's motives are, like, I care about your soul, but also, yeah, I want people to be doing good things. And I'm not like, oh, man, you should be doing bad things because you're a bad guy. Like, obviously, I don't want that. And if you're doing good things. Like, it's it's trickier to me than Punisher going out killing people, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty anti-utilitarian. Everyone knows that. And I'd be like, yeah, Punisher is actually a bad guy. For me, I feel like I could just say that, look at him, and like, yeah, no, that's bad. But Sherlock, he's not killing people. He's not breaking the law. He's just arrogant. He's just a jerk. And the fact that we know that if the situation was different, he would be a bad guy, doesn't make him a bad guy in this moment. That's so true. I, I just feel like that's trickier. Yeah. So I guess the thing is, like, how how do we handle that? Not to get too churchy, but how do we handle that as Christians? Like, when we see someone who is doing good, but we know their soul is in a bad space. How do we speak to that? I mean, not like I, we need to, I, I personally, I'm not the kind of thing person that thinks we need to go out there and tell everyone they're going to hell. I don't think we should do that. But if, if for some reason, Basil were to approach you and ask you himself about his motives and what you think about it, how, like, how do you speak to that? I think to Basil specifically, I, I would say, uh, who ca- I don't care. I don't know why you're asking, <laughs> telling me, uh, <laughs> go do your job. See, I I feel like I think for people though, for humans, questions. Uh yeah. There needs to be some intentionality behind what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And and I also do think, and this is where I this is why I believe my religion. I'll just believe it for fun. I genuinely think that if you have good motives and your heart is right, you can do more good, if that makes sense. Um it's the same thing. My argument against utilitarianism is really a really utilitarian argument where I think if you do things because of you care about the outcome. Eventually, you'll do wrong things or do the wrong thing because you don't actually know what the outcome's going to be. So I think in general, doing things for a good motive, doing things because you're doing it the right way 
will end up creating more good, which is why I'm against utilitarianism, which is kind of ironic because it's kind of a utilitarian argument against utilitarianism. <laughs> but yeah, I think it makes sense still. Yeah. It's like uh, like the Ferengi in Star Trek, where they were finally convinced that in the long run, it's better for business if they were more hospitable and kinder to people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as far as like where else you can find these characters, you might have to help me. I literally I've only seen Radigan and Villainous. That's it. I've not seen them anywhere else. I don't think like parks or anything. Uh, Radigan gets his own little vignette in Once Upon a Halloween. Really? Yeah, he's, he's one That's of the cool. he's one of the parts. Oh, are and they in then, the House of Villains by chance? Yeah, I'm pretty oh, sure okay. Radigan is. OK, cool. But so they're uh, not completely unknown outside of this. No. Uh, and Basil gets a cameo in Darkwing Duck. What? Wait, there's for a, real? Well, not not the actual Basil, but there's a little statue of Basil in his hidden base. I'm looking this up right now. I can't believe it's a Darkwing Duck reference I didn't get. Oh, my gosh. This is crazy. Sorry. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, we see Disney get back to normal. You know, they had a rough spot. The Black Cauldron. We both loved it. We did an episode about it outside of this series. People can check that out. Um, but this is them getting back to normal before they break everything wide open with the Renaissance movies. We'll talk about next time. I think uh, Pang, Kino and Christian are going to talk about Lion King the next time on this series. Yeah, that'll be a good one. But for the final final thought, bad guys in this movie are trying to deceive the masses. This is kind of like when I'm looking at like the general plot, Radigan, what he's trying to do, he's trying to deceive everybody so that he can win. And Basil, whether good motives or not, he's making everything transparent. He's trying to solve the mystery. Um, how important do you think it is that we be transparent, DJ, as opposed to, yeah, because the thing is like a lot of people do this where, oh, I wasn't lying, but you were being deceptive, which to yeah. me is the same thing as lying. Yes. A lot of people are like, I did not lie. I just didn't tell them the whole truth. Oh, yeah. you That's called lying by omission. Uh, pretty sure it's got its own Wikipedia article. Very yeah. well-established thing. I think transparency is the most uh, important thing an entity, business, government can have with its constituents or customers or you know supporters. Yeah. I think it's something the church really needs to work on. Yeah. 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 I am. Um, that's kind of like yeah. why we don't like Catholicism sometimes. <laughs> I was like, wait, I like Catholicism. But yeah, no, I see what you mean. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. They, they've had, you know, a lot of all They had their moments. The past. Yeah. Um, I think just to call myself out, I actually used to tell the truth to be deceptive. Like I would sarcastically tell people exactly what I did. I remember like in high school, I snuck out once and my parents were like, what were you? What were you doing last night? We didn't see you. You were so late. And I was like, yeah, I was totally just out with my girlfriend in the middle of the night and, you know, make something up and just said exactly what I was doing. Yeah, that worked. <laughs> but I said it sarcastically. So I was like, I told the truth. No, that's still a lie. Like, I, I think in general, and this is where I get to the motives thing too. The condition of your heart is of the utmost important. When you... Go to the judgment, like this is me being very literal to some people, but I think in the end, when you're before God or however it all works, I think it's going to come down to where was your heart? Was your heart right with God or was it not? It's not going to matter if you technically lied or not. It's not going to matter if, you know, I did the right thing, but you were arrogant. The condition of your heart, I think, is what matters. And when we're talking about our faith and our spirituality, that's the kind of things I really want to focus on and uh, leave us thinking about because I don't have any you know, good answers of what you can do about it. But I think you should reflect on your own motives and heart better. We should all do that better. Yeah. TJ, final words. Yeah. TJ said the Great Mouse Detective was a great movie. Yeah, no, yeah. Great Mouse Detective is a great movie. Radigan's a severely underrated villain and one of the most fun pieces to play in Villainous, in my opinion. Uh, uh, that's true. Yeah. Just not as good as Dr. Facilier. If you've never played Villainous, check it out. Try it with a couple friends. Disney, pay us. Yeah. Also, Prince John's my favorite in Villainous. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> we're going to wrap up and do recommendations. I recommend you play Villainous and be Prince John. Yeah. Yeah. You got any recommendations for him? <laughs> um, I I can't recommend Valorant. Uh, I recommend watching The Great Mouse Detective because I bet you haven't. That's probably true. And it's Disney Vault is basically gone now. You just Disney Plus. Boom. There it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. Fantastic movie. I actually do think I like it more than your average Disney film. And I love your average Disney film. Yeah. So with that in mind, check out The Great Mouse Detective. Play Radigan, Prince John, and um, who's the who's the other guy? Facilier. 
Yeah, play it as all of those characters in Disney's villainous card game. Fantastic stuff. Subscribe to our show on Captivate or on Patreon, Amazon Ministries Podcast Network if you want. One last question we're about to do. Also, you know, subscribe, Apple Podcasts or Spotify for free because we just need people to subscribe because you like to, we like to interact with you and we can't do that unless you interact with us first, unfortunately. So yeah, maybe check that out. Again, you can go to the show notes down below for a link to our whole series. Listen to all of our Disney era episodes. I love all of them. Um, and go to our stores for some fun merch, some soft t-shirts, good stuff, rep our show. And remember, we're all the chosen people, a geekdom of priests. This was an Anazao Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazao Ministries podcast network.